All right, everybody. I think now could be a good time to go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Michael Hatt with RLE Technologies, and today I will be uh, reviewing RLE's view of uh, enterprise connectivity and integration. I am an account manager here in the Midwest. I uh, live in uh, northwest Indiana, just outside of Chicago, and I uh, help to take care of this Midwest region, it's, uh, as well as my other colleagues, Cam, uh, who helps to take care of the West Coast, as well as International, and, and Jennifer, who uh, helps manage the East Coast as well. Uh, a couple house notes here. I believe I have everybody on listen-only mode, uh, so if there are any questions, please use the chat function, and we will uh, go ahead and try to answer everything at the end of this. Uh, but certainly appreciate the opportunity to uh, to present uh, kind of our vision of uh, what a connected building may look like and, and some of the enterprise connectivity that uh, uh, can assist in a migration path of an existing uh, uh, structure. So again, Michael Hatt with RLE. Uh, I've been in the building automation industry for roughly 10 years. Uh, my focus has really been always on the connected building and uh, the different products that can integrate together to, dr to drive a result. I've uh, been with RLE for almost two years, and I'm really excited uh, to bring the technology to additional markets to ensure that the industry knows how RLE can impact the health and safety of, of a variety of different buildings. Today, our outline is going to be a review of RLE Enterprise Facility Monitoring Solutions and what they look like, a migration path, how RLE products are integrated to an existing enterprise strategy, as well as I'll review a few different projects that uh, uh, we've either walked, designed, and or sold. Um, and then while you're listening through all of this, what I'd, what I'd like you to kind of think about is what are some of the products that I'm seeing that I can help to enable an outcome? I think that's ultimately what, uh, what we're trying to, to get to. And uh, throughout this, I'm going to be uh, going through talking and bragging about some of the openness of the RLE products and how we can all uh, pull them together. So when we get into the RLE uh, facility monitoring solution, we're really looking at a variety of pieces. Uh, facility monitoring, especially on an enterprise, could be a large scale system uh, with a lot of different individual pieces that integrate up to it. So our enterprise head end is the FMS facility monitoring solution, Falcon product. And uh, in, in, the, in the direction that the industry is ultimately going and has been going, everything literally is going to be connected and monitored in the building. Uh, the, the future is also going to continue to connect additional devices and network devices. And, and really this pandemic has put the data center industry in the front of uh, the most importance of all of the connectivity and, and, and protection you can provide to anybody. It's the data centers that are, that are keeping us all connected. So uh, what we'll review is kind of how we fit into a variety of these different environments. Uh, what I have here is, again, on the top right, a picture of our FMS uh, facility monitoring solution. Uh, single FMS can integrate up to 32 devices. Some of those devices may be RLE devices. Some of them may be third-party devices. But uh, really, anything BACnet, Modbus, and SNMP are devices that the FMS is able to integrate. There's also uh, some I.O. capability that I'll, I'll review here in just a few. But I, I like the network architecture because there's a lot more in a network architecture that currently exists into uh, a, a building network strategy, right? These are a few of the devices that we can connect into that strategy. And, uh, you know, between the uh, uh, water leak detection, very important aspect of, uh, of building protection as far as infrastructure protection goes. Water goes down and creates a big mess. And it's not typically a matter of if, it's a matter of when. So our leak detection products, uh, a variety of them are IP enabled and can integrate into other enterprise systems as well as ours. Uh, the, the few systems that I'm showing here uh, in the bottom right is a distance read leak detection, which is uh, a system that is able to identify a distance at which a leak was detected. And what you do with that, that information is ultimately a migration path and some planning that we hope we can enable uh, with you and your organization today uh, because a lot of times it's a scramble on the back end, what do we do now? Well, if it takes a little bit of time on the front end to make sure there's a good uh, risk mitigation plan, uh, you can do a variety of different uh, uh, sequence of events, a cause and effect 
uh, impacts, right? If water leaks, do I just alarm, or do I send a signal to close a water valve, or do I trip a, a fire relay to uh, get a fire security system going, uh, or some other security system going? So uh, there's a lot of uh, functionality that, as simple as it is, water leak detection is an extremely important aspect, especially in a lot of the buildings today uh, that may or may not have the occupancy that once did. Uh, the device on the, the second to the right there is what's called an F200. It's our network device that has, uh, I have a slide on it uh, later here, but it, it, it's able to connect and make visible temperature, humidity, water leak detection, as well as uh, eight digital inputs. There's a relay output on it as well so that you can trigger something like a camera. Uh, as shown here, we're not necessarily manufacturing or selling cameras, but what I wanted to show here is the impact and the, 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 the uh, enablement of an outcome which I know a lot of folks are looking for, which is uh, to, to trigger a camera to start recording based on an environmental function and, and an event. Uh, it's a very capable device there. So the, the next device uh, on the left is our wing manager. I'm uh, uh, totally geeky about the uh, wireless side of uh, technology because, uh, one, it's simple to deploy. Uh, two, it reduces massive costs in installation. Uh, three, the variety of sensing uh, objects are available. The flexibility of being able to sense almost anything is uh, is in your is, is technically in your fingertips. Is uh, as well as uh, uh, the battery life and and the overall part of how it fits into an integration migration strategy. And then. Um, so when we get into the enterprise, what what else is an FMS capable of monitoring? We're able to monitor almost anything that is BACnet, Modbus, and SMMT. Integration is key. Data aggregation is key. Uh, what we're trying to accomplish is simplify visibility of uh, data points for the purpose of monitoring, alarming, or even integration into other analytic systems or uh, compliance reporting or different things like that to ensure that there's a simplified way to get data from one end to the other and do something with it. So we've uh, traditionally been known for our ability to integrate with different crack units and PDUs, power meters, uh, UPSs, uh, integrating different IP cameras, and, and even uh, uh, filling, filling the void with some of the uh, fire panels and security systems that exist today. RLE is excited about this FMS because it does have some robust capabilities and uh, expansion as well because it's not just an integration platform. It can also be an I.O. device. Uh, monitoring system, which can ultimately bring in any temperature, humidity, uh, uh, motion sensor, door, light, um, you know, almost anything that you can connect physically with a wire via 4 to 20 milliamp, 0 to 5 volt, or even a 0 to 10 volt system, uh, we have the ability to connect up into it. Uh, this is a picture of our uh, full expanded FMS. It's a 2U enclosure with uh, the capability to connect up to 104 inputs. Um, those are physical points, right? So why is this important? Because there are still a lot of folks that are trying to do uh, relay logic. So adding expansion card A into an FMS could be a real nice way to uh, provide additional AIs into a system for monitoring. Is Maybe it's a compliance reporting type situation. I was actually in a scenario the other day where they wanted to deploy one of these as almost like a commissioning device and then also tie back a variety of IP cameras to it so that they have visibility into specific points of where they were trying to look at. So uh, really, I mean, we get into the migration path and the overall network architecture. The FMS is a pretty powerful device that can do a lot if it is a lot that you're looking to accomplish. Or it can scale down to do slightly a little uh, with that capability to expand as well. Where does this typically fit? Uh, switch rooms, data halls, mechanical rooms. I've seen it in industrial uh, places as well for monitoring. And uh, you know, ultimately, with some of the visibility and interface maps that we have uh, built into this, uh, it's, a, it's a pretty complete system that has that ability to create uh, simplified identification of situations with a visual uh, for alarming to resolve site issues immediately, right? So having a, a picture of an enterprise like on the top left 
of the United States. These are all the, the areas in which an RLE device exists and the status of which they exist. You'd be able to drill down a little bit more into specific areas all the way down to the specific uh, location picture uh, of the space that you're monitoring with all of the data points that you would want to pull into that as well. I do want to give a plug to my man Cam here that's going to be doing a webinar series in a couple of weeks on June 11th, specifically regarding the Delta View maps. So I won't steal his thunder here, but certainly wanted to make sure to mention uh, our ability to have some visualization inside of the graphical user interface to drive the outcome. Um, the F200 is, is really a critical zone monitoring appliance. Uh, it sits on a network, talks Modbus or SNMP. It's built with four temperature and or temperature humidity sensor options. It uh, can do sp spot detection or leak detection with sensing cable up to 200 feet. Uh, I mentioned earlier the integration with a potential camera, so uh, we can actually pull in an IP camera directly to this user interface and then also leverage the relay output to trigger that camera to start doing recording based on an environmental event. Maybe a temperature is too high. Maybe you have a smoke detector in there uh, and it, it tripped the uh, relay, right? Maybe there's a, a leak that occurred and you want that camera to start recording. Maybe hydrogen is, uh, is a gas that that has uh, you know, hit a threshold that is uh, dangerous to the environment. So we want to go ahead and trip that as well. So there's a lot of ways that the F200 can be deployed. And uh, some of my favorite are typically within IDF rooms and data closets. Uh, I actually have a pretty unique project currently uh, going on with freezer monitoring. So we're going to use the F200 in about 30 different sites tied back to an F uh, FMS. And then the FMS is going to create an enterprise view of the temperatures across those 30 locations. And then uh, the expansion uh, over time will include cameras and door contacts and some other uh, motion sensors and things like that as well. So uh, excited about that, but because it also does some trending, it made it, for a, made it made to be a perfect migration platform because you can do a little now or you can do some of that trending and algorithms inside of the FMS as well. Uh, to, to plug a, uh, uh, a video that was created here shortly ago, there is a Cliff Notes overview that we'll send out following this, uh, which uh, displays the simplicity of setup and uh, kind of the overall functionality of the F200 as well. We'll make sure to send that out. <clears throat> so enterprise campus monitoring. Uh, I got into this a little bit because uh, what we're really looking for in a typical environment, this could be a typical environment where you just have one FMS that's connected to a variety of different systems. Again, these are obviously promoting our systems, but uh, you know the end goal is to create a migration path and to create connectivity between uh, systems that could help to solve problems or alleviate problems or minimize catastrophes, right? So the FMS and, and our systems are really built to do that. In this particular architecture, what I'm sharing is uh, kind of a, uh, a sense that, let's just pretend this is in a building, this is an FMS in a building that's connected to one of our relay replicators. Some of these relays now could go out to, you know, this is a 10 in, 20 out relay replicator. So some of those relays could be assigned to a security panel or a security system or some other alarm monitoring system or a strobe light or a siren. So these are uh, very valid systems that, uh, that have that expansion capabilities. The F200 that's slightly below that is, uh, is an example of how this can sit inside of a, a data closet, but then also have what's called our power fail monitor available to trip and create an alarm in the F200, which then creates an alarm in the uh, FMS, which then can be emailed or uh, texted based on your preference and setup, right? Um, the wireless system in the middle is part of a uh, part of a project that we had done collectively with all of these, actually, in, uh, in an environment where they had a, a variety of spaces uh, that required differential air pressure monitoring as well as temperature and humidity, but then they also wanted to monitor some of the different spaces in the data center as well. So the migration capability of getting data and pushing it and passing it to a variety of systems is also a, a pretty impactful uh, opportunity because some of the data you may need could be impacting how the building automation system is operating. So let's think globally about 
how can data be passed to optimize system performance, which is ultimately what we're after for two reasons, energy performance, but most importantly, more than ever now, indoor air quality. So when we talk about a migration path, I thought it was neat to, to share that the FMS is, uh, is really a stackable network infrastructure. Uh, it has the ability to connect and integrate up to 32 devices. If you wanted to get up to that next level of, let's say you had 50 devices or 150 devices, you pick your number, right? Uh, the FMS would be able to continue to stack up to, uh, to connect as many devices as required. And what's also neat about that then is that the Delta V mapping can also then migrate all the way down to create a pretty robust uh, uh, graphical interface to allow for uh, some alarming and, and visualization of the status of different environments. So in the migration path that we've, uh, we've identified here, what I think is important to also note is RLE is not charging any license fees or maintenance costs. So if you're looking to aggregate data, get data to another device, get data to an enterprise system, or use the FMS as your enterprise system, uh, it's a very, very, very flexible system that I think can solve a lot of problems moving forward um, and enable a lot of outcomes based on what the end goal of is uh, from every customer. So the wing link on the bottom left is actually a migration path product that we built to allow some of our new technology to integrate with some of the legacy technology. So we know that we have a great base of uh, wireless products that are out there that were part of our legacy platform. We wanted to enable those legacy technologies to allow them to expand into some of the new sensor technology that we have. So the wing link is a, is a, is a platform that's capable of doing that. The protocol converter is, uh, is a protocol is, is exactly that. We're taking BACnet, Modbus, and SNMP and converting it to one of the others. So you may have um, um, Modbus points that you need to serve up SNMP. You may have BACnet points you need to serve up a different protocol as well. So this is a way that you can do that, to, again, to enable an outcome. There was a uh, analytics company I was talking with the other day, and, and they only accepted Modbus points, and they required that other systems send them Modbus points. So we had identified that and said, well, you know, if you use the protocol converter, you can really expand your marketplace to allow you to get additional points out there. So, you know, consider that protocol converter because it is a very viable option in the marketplace, simple to set up, and again, no ongoing fees or maintenance costs. The BMS integration platform is a fairly new platform launched last year, which includes uh, Wing Wireless. It's a scaled-down zone version of the Wing Wireless that connects BACnet MSTP or Modbus RTU. The, um, uh, there's, a, there's a one wire as well as the wireless, and then there's also a three-zone leak detection that are part of this family. And again, I mean, the, the purpose of this is to, to, to solve a problem in a specific zone to get you the data to create an outcome, right? So uh, the BMS integration is an exciting tool that we've used. Uh, a couple of great applications, obviously, for the three zone would be any area that you have three zones. But recently here, I sold one that, uh, that fit an elevator pit. So there were two elevators that were uh, fairly close next to each other. So they, they split off two legs of that, and then I'll use the third leg in, uh, in the bathroom area that was uh, near that area as well. So the three zone leak detection is a great fit. Uh, the the uh, wing wireless, or the uh, BMS wing, I should call it, is uh, 50, 50 sensors uh, that are connected back, Modbus, RTU, or BACnet MSTP. Uh, simple way to get additional aggregation of data into different zones uh, to bring that up to an automation system for uh, ultimate uh, compliance or uh, or system uh, optimization, and then as uh, also discussed, our relay replicator. Again, it's it's a migration path. So, which part of the of these technologies could you fit to to help your end user? And some of you are end users. Solve the end outcome of what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, maybe the initial goal is just a, a signal uh, relay, right? So, I want to take one input and pass it to five or six different systems. Uh, so that relay replicator could certainly be a nice migration path. And as, as we talk about all of this, I mean, really the migration path is, is really around what, what inside of an enterprise can we add to uh, an existing enterprise or begin the infrastructure uh, protection of a, of a new structure, and how do they all fit together? So, you know, with, with our capability of being able to talk open with BACnet, Modbus, and SNMP, 
they have a pretty strong uh, product portfolio that, that can certainly do that and, and fit inside of a variety of uh, migration paths. When, uh, when asked uh, about some of the different projects we've worked on, uh, this was one that I really thought was neat and I thought it was fitting to kind of fit into uh, this particular presentation because it was around a healthcare. It was a, it was a major healthcare uh, group on the East Coast that was able to deploy a variety of our, pro our platforms to aggregate that data back to a DSIM system that they had ultimately for protection and system optimization. So what they were using was the F200 in a couple of switch rooms and data closets. Uh, they were tying the uh, environmental conditions back to a relay output on a camera to trigger any kind of recording that may be necessary. And then uh, in the other room, they also had a power fail monitor because uh, they wanted to obviously know if power tripped in, in one of those areas. And then they were, they were leveraging the wing manager in their data center for temperature, humidity, uh, leak detection, as well as differential air pressure. So uh, the combination of all these systems came back to an FMS. And we leveraged this architecture because the FMS ended up kind of separating out the network ensuring that we just weren't loading the network full of devices. So the FMS became an aggregator of the data. Uh, and all of these data points came into it Modbus. And then the FMS was able to output that data to an enterprise DSIM system uh, via SNMP. So again, thinking about the scale and the migration path of everything that's capable, uh, we're excited because we can continue to expand on that particular platform in different parts of the hospital and uh, continue to provide protection into those spaces. And then this is probably one of my favorite types of uh, uh, application-driven integrations because the majority of buildings that exist today already have some level of automation. And how do you expand the functionality of that uh, uh, automation system? And a lot of folks end up ripping it out and replacing it or putting it in as uh, you know, a capital planning, which ends up being a pretty costly endeavor to, uh, uh, to migrate. So uh, an application that here we've recently been approved to do is uh, basically taking our Wi-Fi temp humidity transmitters, putting them throughout uh, this building, now they're all talking Wi-Fi, so the communication is the Wi-Fi back to the wing manager. The wing manager is passing all that data back net to the enterprise system. And then the enterprise system, since it's already connected to all the field controllers, we're passing that data point down to all those field controllers in each of those rooms, which is now being controlled uh, based on the temperature value being provided by our Wi-Fi temp humidity transmitters. I just think this is a this is a great a example of how technology and integration comes together to drive an outcome, uh, and how we can be a piece of that puzzle to solve those problems. Uh, with the inability to get into buildings as often as we used to, with the cost structures that uh, uh, that are always being questioned, uh, using and leveraging wireless can be a, few, a great way, really, to uh, not cost out of a job. Uh, speed up the implementation and get your project team out from under this job and onto another project. Uh, with the shortage and demand of manpower in the market today, uh, we believe that having this wireless capability really does allow us and you to expand your services offering and uh, deliver a different kind of an outcome. So when when uh, when I when I used to travel a bunch, uh, there's a variety of places that was always fun to go walk into. And so our Wing Wireless again is uh, is a pretty powerful platform. And when asked about will it work in my building, uh, my general answer is yes. Uh, typically speaking, I'm, I got a high degree of confidence that we can make our wireless work in almost any building as long as it's uh, architected correctly, right? Uh, so our, our Wing Wireless is a 900 megahertz platform, but we also do have the Wi-Fi capability on our temp humidity transmitter. And then <clears throat> our uh, Wing Wireless has is, is, uh, got a signal strength that is, is pretty impressive. Uh, from 
Line of sight at 600 feet from uh, uh, an individual sensor transmitter to a range extender or a wing manager. And then the range extender can actually talk up to uh, roughly 1,000 feet from the wing manager. So if you think about the majority of the buildings that you're within, typically a wing manager and one or two of the range extenders plus up to 400 of our transmitters can be connected in any building uh, to deliver the outcome that's desired. Uh, given today and, and the pandemic and, and, and the importance of indoor air quality, some of the, the uh, application uses that we're looking at today are really temperature and humidity as well as uh, differential air pressure. Uh, traditionally, that's a lot of these uh, um, environmental conditions are invisible. They're hard to tangibilize. So with our ability to deploy our wireless technology and be independent from uh, another network, uh, we, we can effectively walk into almost any building and in 30 minutes to an hour uh, deploy our system and, and, uh, and, and show visibility uh, immediately and, and make the invisible visible. So some of the sites that I had walked were data centers. Uh, the project of the week uh, last week was a mall. Uh, opportunity that we were looking at. Malls are scared to open. Uh, malls have uh, the most uh, to, to gain from, you know, having compliance in place and, and providing a, a reasonable accommodation to say that they, they're measuring these, these factors. Uh, positive building pressure is what buildings are looking for to uh, keep, keep the good air in and, and cycling, uh, cycling uh, um, indoor air quality so that you have 22, 24s, roughly air changes uh, to accommodate any stale air that may be swirling around. You want to get fresh air in, uh, but you have to do it right. Your automation system has to be set up to accommodate that. So what we want to be able to do is enable that opportunity to make that visible so that you can migrate into making control logic changes and things like that. So, uh, so that particular project, they were looking to deploy the wing manager almost as a commissioning unit uh, to ensure the compliance of uh, the buildings were in a positive state, ensuring that uh, uh, good air was staying in and, and wasn't sucking in negative pressure, which was uh, pulling in bad air. Uh, another couple of projects that we walked were hospitals and nursing homes. These seem to be uh, obviously very important aspects of our society today, and uh, having that ability to provide data quickly and easily is, uh, is more important than ever. And uh, the standardization uh, is just as important of, uh, if I asked any of the network guys, being able to put uh, technology on a network and know that it's going to operate the way it's supposed to and, uh, and provide all the wireless network metrics and the, the, uh, the, the system objects for each of the points that are being pulled in. So the simplification of integration is, uh, is certainly there. Another kind of a neat way that we're leveraging some of our technology is with the RTD wireless transmitter. In, uh, in some of the freezers uh, that they've, uh, they've asked us to do. So we're deploying some of our wireless technology to uh, be a secondary alarm monitoring system to allow some, some uh, seamless and integrated uh, visibility across a variety of platforms that today are kind of just one-off systems all brought to a network that really aren't managed. So, you know, at the end of the day, we, we really want to ensure that uh, uh, visibility, seamlessness, openness, and overall integration are, are objects of uh, the migration path. Uh, kind of a neat application that, uh, that I had walked as well was at an industrial plant, big chemical manufacturer. Uh, they, had, uh, they had a challenge with uh, being able to monitor temperatures on, in some of the areas where they had uh, harsh chemicals, but then they also needed to ensure some of the uh, leak detection aspects were also covered because when those chemicals hit any of the cement or the ground, I mean, it was nasty stuff that just ate it away. So they needed to be immediately notified. So we're able to deploy our chemical sensing cable with our wireless wing uh, leak detection transmitter. Uh, and then some of the other areas that they were looking at, which is going to be a phase two, phase three part of the project, is uh, extending out thousands of feet of uh, chemical sensing cable throughout some of the common areas where these chemicals are pathways are, are ran. So obviously having any kind of a chemical in any pathway that people are walking on is, uh, is, is generally not, not a good idea. Uh, we've also, uh, I've also been to uh, a couple of airports where we deployed our 
uh, wireless to validate that we can get the transmission signals. And, uh, and they have a, a variety of different spaces in airports. It's not just the main walkways. Uh, there's, uh, the, the leak detection is, is just as important, if not even more important, because of the long runs of pipe that are everywhere and all the little restaurants and all the bathrooms and everything that's out there. Uh, being able to cover and have coverage in those spaces reliably that can integrate into another uh, enterprise strategy is, is, is really key to uh, the protection of those environments and obviously having uh, ensuring that building pressure and indoor air quality are other aspects of, uh, of building monitoring and environment monitoring that we can, uh, we can provide there. Uh, and then one of my favorite projects we did here was, uh, was at a museum where we were protecting a lot of the uh, historical artifacts that were uh, in the archives, not even in the museum. So we deployed roughly 100 uh, wing wireless water sensing devices, uh, wa uh, water leak detection cables on top of the uh, cabinets that were electric and moved. So, uh, I, you know, this is kind of a good time to chat a little bit about a lesson learned there and the environmental impact of how environmental conditions can, imp <clears throat> excuse me, impact how a leak detection cable can operate. So what we found was uh, after about a week of deployment, there was about three or four sensing cables that continued to uh, alarm. There was no leak, but there was an alarm that was tripping. Uh, so the first thing we did was uh, created in our wing wireless platform an alarm delay. So our transmitters are going to talk every 10 to 20 seconds on the radio transmitters, every 10 to 20 seconds up to a 12-year battery life. Pretty impressive for uh, a wireless platform. So we were catching some of these that were uh, falling out of uh, that 20-second range and creating a, an immediate uh, triggered alarm. So we, we modified that to 30 seconds. In some cases, it was a minute. And then the other thing was what we noticed was where some of these cables were located was right directly underneath blower vents. So when air was, was turned on, as it obviously would be turned on at different points in time, that air was condensating and creating um, a spread inside of the threshold of the default of the, the cables. So what we ended up having to do is identify that those couple of cables actually needed to be modified as well. So there's different parameters that you can set on these cables to ensure that these types of little tweaks and commissioning can be performed to ensure a solid running, uh, smooth running, and uh, ongoing reliable leak detection system. So, a variety of different ways that we've been deployed there. Uh, there's a couple of other places that we've, uh, we've we've obviously been outside of the data center. So I just, you know, I wanted to just share with you a few other areas of consideration that you could deploy, find, and uh, uh, impact uh, different industry businesses as well. Building uses have changed, right? I think uh, the majority of us have worked from home now for a while. Uh, the different commercial buildings inside of uh, the different cities we all live in. Some of them aren't ever going to be the same. Uh, many of them will be uh, filled again and uh, obviously excited about that. And, uh, but the uses of those buildings uh, may change as well. Uh, they may not all be commercial structures. There may be some level of living quarters built into these uh, high rises and these buildings. There may be a variety of different uh, um, uses for these buildings that may traditionally not have been uh, previously thought of or have thought of, but never the sense of urgency to deliver that, right? So with, with, every, with a lot of folks working from home now, um, you know, the high rises and residential condos and those uh, apartment buildings that a, a lot of us have lived in or are living in uh, need to have additional protection. Uh, the number of uh, occupants inside of a building was effectively managed and set up and uh, estimated to have X amount of residents for, you know, X amount of time inside of that building because it was based on a five-day work week. Well, now all those residences are typically in that building 70 to 100 percent of the time, which traditionally it was probably closer to 30 to 50 percent of the time. So the use of buildings have changed. So in those residential spaces specifically, uh, we need to look at how uh, water is being used and, and how the condition space is being leveraged. So 
could uh, differential air pressure monitoring be something important or even uh, in validating temperatures and humidities in those different spaces obviously are going to get a little bit more usage now that those buildings are full. Uh, CO2 monitoring, carbon monoxide monitoring, all different things that we can help to impact. And there was a project I was working on here not long ago as well, and what we looked at was a wireless leak detection system to cover pretty much the, the middle of the building where the elevator shaft was, the elevator pit, as well as uh, the variety of bathrooms and different uh, spots inside of the piping that sprawled from east to west and north to south in the entire building. So uh, leveraging a wireless leak detection system, again, could be a migration path to say, hey, I need to make sure these spaces are monitored today. But boy, would it be nice to add additional sensing, maybe, uh, like I said, the tank humidity. Maybe there's uh, an analog input that you want to put a sensor somewhere, but don't have a good way to, to wire it back. Well, we can transmit any analog transmission uh, that's a 0 to 5 volt, 0 to 10 volt, or 4 to 20 milliamp output of almost any sensor. So get creative, right? Let's think about what are the building owners looking to monitor and manage, and let's put together a way to help them do that affordably, efficiently, and effectively. Ultimately, though, let's also look at, since we're talking about this, uh, risk mitigation planning. I think now is as good of time, if ever, to have that discussion. Since there are fewer occupants in a building uh, today, maybe not here in the near future, but there are a lot of areas in these buildings that have water. That water has been sitting stagnant. Some of that water is pressurized. So we need to make sure that we're looking at these different aspects of the building. So if there's nothing else that you are looking to do with any of this, please at least spend the time to have a conversation about risk mitigation planning. Okay. Uh, I also know that there's a lot of folks that I've recently spoke to that are looking to do retro commissioning in these buildings. So again, having that capability to deploy a reliable wireless system without pulling wire with, and, and getting a team on and, in and out of a job more rapidly uh, holds a lot of value. And then creating that visibility with our uh, web user interface inside of the Wing Manager that can be standalone today, but then integrated as well as part of your migration path is, uh, is certainly an application that, uh, that I think makes a lot of sense and can easily be accomplished. You know, the, the, the ultimate goal is to create visibility, again, around the invisible. So, and in some cases visible, right, when water comes pouring down. <laughs> so uh, uh, I took a snapshot of this because I was asked to put together a, a design for a water leak detection, one of our distance re leak systems. Uh, the top half of this graphic was a data hall, and it was just a big square, so I cut that off. Uh, because really what I wanted to show here was the function of the X connector. When deploying a distance read leak detection system, uh, the X connector can be such a critical aspect of any design. So instead of running cables 100 feet one way and 100 feet back to then go south on your drawing here, uh, what we're able to do is deploy an X connector, which then splits that cable out three ways to allow you to expand the coverage inside of the building or data hall or whatever it is you're looking to, uh, to monitor. So our LD5200 is uh, our most robust, uh, complete feature-rich uh, leak detection system, can handle up to 10,000 feet of sensing cable. And our little brother to that is the LD2100, which can do up to 5,000 feet of sensing cable. Again, these have the, the rich features, the web user interface, alarming capabilities, integration, could be standalone, could be integrated. Uh, so there, there is a lot of flexibility there. But there are a number of jobs that we've also leveraged, uh, products like our uh, Seahawk 10K or the LD1500, which is really a distance read leak system geared only towards integration. So let's just say we want to integrate all those data points, Modbus, back to my head-end enterprise system and then create all the alarming and graphical user interface and all of that in there. So this is, uh, you know, again, another way to create a migration path into an existing system, but then also have that capability to be standalone or separate as well. So I, I just kind of like this picture because of the, um, the X connectors there. But then I ask, well, what else do you see? 
what else did you see in that uh, picture, right? So here's, uh, here's an initial design request for the data hall that we did. Uh, airflow performance. You know, so of course we sold the leak detection, but what else do you see? You see the airflow performance. Our, our triad panels are built with a, uh, a stratification fin uh, that is faced towards the air supply, which is going to scoot the air up into the air and focus it from three to seven feet uh, which is where the, the cooling is required in a cabinet, right? Uh, the hot aisle, cold aisle containment are questions that, uh, that we also have the opportunity to resolve, right? Airflow is one of the biggest things that is creating energy waste inside of a data center. Well, not one of the biggest, obviously all the servers are <laughs> creating all the energy use, right? But keeping, you're spending millions of dollars to keep those servers cool why not spend just a little bit more to isolate those hot aisles or those cold aisles to ensure the most optimal uh, airflow inside of that space? Uh, there's, there's, it's all custom too. Let me make sure to say that. So there's rigid, there's soft, there's white, there's black. There's, uh, there's a variety of different uh, ways that we can cut around different systems. Uh, sliding doors, saloon doors. Uh, and again, I mean, the ultimate goal of, hot aisle and cold aisle containment is to create system optimization. So there's a, there's a stat that you can probably use, which is roughly 4% savings with a one degree increase of temperature in that space. So it's not impossible to hear somebody saving 20% on their energy costs because they were able to reduce the air temperature in that space. A couple other things that I would see inside of this data hall. Hey, this, this uh, blue panel on the top right is uh, pretty slick because now you have the ability to brand your data center. There was uh, a lot of folks that were going out and showing off their data center. So why not drop a couple of these panels into your space to really boast and brag that you got the coolest data center in the space, right? Uh, on the left-hand side, there's the Clearview panels that uh, we have quite a few data center managers that are using for a variety of reasons. The big one is to create visibility under that floor. Is there electrical outlets? Is there uh, piping? Are there valves? Things that you want to see under the floor but we've also had some guys that wanted to use it as a, kind of the cool feature, right? So they wanted to put blue LEDs that would trigger based on a door opening so that you had a nice glow into that space. Airflow is also impacted by um, some of the underfloor uh, uh, ventilation that's going. So if you have half your data center not being used, let's put some underfloor baffling in to block off that, uh, that airflow to protect that space so that you're not wasting energy in an area that's currently not used, right? Let's keep it focused. And then blanking panels inside of those cabinets. We have lots of them. We'd love to help you out with those. Don't leave the, the gaps in those open because you are wasting energy. And then if there are other gaps in the floor or around the grommets and things like that, let's ensure that we do put some foam in there to, uh, to, to close those gaps off and ensure airflow. So the other things inside of this data hall that I see are environmental conditions uh, that can be impacted. We've talked a lot about the wing already. Uh, one of the newest products that we just launched is our raised floor monitoring panel. So inside of any of these data center spaces that you would want to understand air velocity or differential air pressure or tie in some temp and humidity monitoring underneath it, uh, this raised floor panel is a, is a, is a very uh, affordable and easy way to deploy uh, a way to get more data to optimize system performance inside of a, inside of a data hall or, uh, or other environment that you would have a raised floor structure. So, you know, ultimately what, what we're trying to accomplish here and, and uh, the results that you would expect to see with RLE is improved visibility and planning, improved airflow, building pressure, temp, relative humidity, and indoor air quality. Again, it's a combination of how you use the technology to drive the operational effectiveness, as well as uh, critical zone protection. And, uh, you know, we're all looking out for each other, so let's protect our buildings, but let's also make sure that we're protecting our occupants as well. I know there's a lot of conversations out there trying to accomplish this, and I think we have a great fit to, to, to be able to do that. So. Uh, with all of the products that are uh, in the RLE family of, uh, uh, of systems, uh, you can make a difference. And it could be small, but it could be big. So let's, uh, let's continue to look at the migration path and optimize uh, performance where we can. So uh, this is really going to conclude kind of this uh, webinar series here, but uh, for, for me at least. But the next one coming up is going to be pre uh, presented by Cam Rogers. 
and he's going to review the, the GUI. Uh, it's a Delta overview, uh, which RLE products offer it, and then the configuration inside the Falcon and Seahawk products, and then really leveraging a Delta view to quickly identify and resolve side issues is, uh, is the end goal there. So if there are any questions, uh, certainly happy to answer them. I had a, a couple that were sent to me. Uh, my man Chris out in uh, Michigan had sent me a note uh, asking me to uh, kind of talk a little bit more about uh, why I like the analog uh, wing so much. And uh, it's really sensor agnostic, and it's a way to, uh, you know, we, we, we went down a path to say, hey, let's not try to create every sensor in the marketplace. Let's leverage the backbone of what other smart people have accomplished and then just transmit that output to be able to allow a system integrator, building owner, uh, facility manager, data, data center manager, uh, the ability to uh, have those data points and uh, do something with them. So we've connected uh, uh, CO2 sensors, carbon monoxide sensors, current sensors uh, to the analog, as well as a variety of other devices. So, um, you know, total, total fan of that because, again, it's a zero to five volt output. It's, it's accepting any sensor that has a zero to five volt output a zero to 10 volt output or a four to 20 milliamp output. Another question I had received uh, from, uh, from my guy John uh, up in Minnesota was, uh, tell me a little bit more about the wing channels. Uh, so in a dense environment where you may deploy wing wireless, uh, you may have a couple zones near each other or a very dense environment that you want to keep separate from each other. So uh, in the wing manager, there's a channel A, a channel B, and then channel C is to communicate with the range extender. So uh, in an environment where you have density or, again, you're looking to separate the uh, uh, radio frequencies, you can uh, identify channel A is the default on all of our wing wireless products. But you can, with a click of three buttons, uh, three clicks of a button, I should say, change that to channel 2 or channel B, I should say. Uh, removing it from some of the interference that you may have seen on channel A, if in fact you did see any interference, uh, or if you were just trying to keep those two environments separate so that you wouldn't have any crossover on the radio signals inside of that. So, so uh, yeah, I guess with that, I uh, certainly appreciate the opportunity to talk with everybody a little bit more about uh, enterprise connectivity and integration of the RLE products. Certainly look forward to working with you and your teams to uh, create an outcome and enable an outcome. Uh, looking forward to having those conversations and continuing to uh, uh, be a leader in the industry that is uh, certainly uh, uh, helping to uh, drive optimization and visibility so, and protection as well. So uh, thank you for your time today. Have a great rest of the day. Uh, good luck in your endeavors. Feel free to call and reach out to any of our sales support or orders uh, for any help. Have a great day. Talk to you later.